Amen. Amen. You all may have your seats. Thank you for that, Kelly. It's a little less extra than normal, to be honest with you. Good to be with you all today. I go by Ant. I serve as the pastor here at Midtown Two Notch. If you're a guest, very glad that you're here uh, worshiping with us. We appreciate your presence uh, with us today, and we trust that you will be blessed by the Word of God today. If you got a Bible, Luke chapter 19 is where we'll be spending most of our time today. We're finishing up. This is actually the last Sunday uh, in this sermon series that we're entitling Jesus And. Uh, next week, we're going to be celebrating our 10-year anniversary with a new sermon series. So very excited about that. Amen. Very excited about that. We're kicking that off uh, next week. But this week, we're still, we got one more passage, one more interaction of Jesus that we're going to look into. What we've been doing as we've been looking into these interactions of Jesus is noticing how does he respond to different kinds of people, people in different types of situations and circumstances. And through that, we've been learning and growing in our knowledge of his love towards us. The interaction that Jesus has today uh, is with someone who uh, is a bit of a bully, uh, someone who has authority, someone who has power, and uses that authority and power for their own good. Now, before we get into, for, for their own good, I, I should say, by, it, by way of harming others for their own good is what I should say. Now, before we get into this interaction that Jesus has with this man, how would you respond to somebody like that? You have interaction with this person. You have influence as Jesus does. How would you, how would you expect or desire Jesus to respond to someone who takes advantage of people in a position of less power than them for their own good. What would you want Jesus to say? What would you want Jesus to do? I appreciate honesty. We always do. What would you want Jesus? How would you expect Jesus to respond to them? I think for many of us, we've experienced hurt, pain, frustration, from whether someone who is a bully and they, they do this kind of in more person-to-person interactions or whether people are using the, a broader level of influence that they have to push others down, to push themselves up. How does Jesus respond to this bully? Luke chapter 19, starting in verse 1. He entered Jericho, that's talking about Jesus, and was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was Rich. When the Bible is giving you context of a situation or interaction before they start telling you what's happening, you need to make sure you do whatever you can to understand what's being communicated to you in the context about the people that Jesus is interacting with. Zacchaeus was a tax collector. Not only that, he was a chief tax collector. Not only that, he was rich. The tax collectors at this time worked for the Roman, the Roman government. The Roman Empire was huge at this time. I believe the biggest empire that had existed at that time. And one of the things that they would do as they conquered the different people groups is that to, to fund their huge military and to run their kingdom, they would hire people from within the different people groups that they are now leading, that they have conquered. They would hire them to collect oppressive taxes, extremely high taxes over their people. So they're saying, hey, if you come work for us and are willing to receive the taxes from your people for us, not only will we take care of you and make sure you're straight and make sure you're paid well, but any amount that you want to skim off the top for yourself, hey, that's up to you. As long as we get ours, we're good with whatever else you do and we'll back you with our military. So that's what the tax collectors would do. Now, the chief tax collectors, like Zacchaeus was, is someone who would oversee that whole system and that whole process to make sure it's happening so he can get a cut after the cut, if you would. This is Zacchaeus, and he was rich. He did this in such a way that it made him very financially wealthy. He was someone who would push people down to lift himself up. He was someone that would pursue his benefit at, the, at other people's expense. He caused other people pain for his own selfish gain. So the Jewish people, they hated tax collectors. They saw tax collectors putting, profiting off of their oppression, and they despised them. So when Luke says that he is the chief tax collector and he's rich, he's letting us know, hey, the Jews, they hate this brother most likely. Verse 3. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. Y'all know Zacchaeus was a wee little man. Okay. <laughs> and a wee little man was he. Amen. Shout out to Sunday school and VBS. 
Zacchaeus was trying to see who Jesus was. There were so many people around Jesus because he was so short. He couldn't see Jesus. Verse 4. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. So he sees where Jesus is. Can't see Jesus because he's too short. But he knows where Jesus is going. So he runs ahead before Jesus gets there, climbs up in a tree so that he can see Jesus when Jesus gets to where that tree is. I asked you earlier, how would you engage or respond to someone that is a bully that essentially uses their power and influence to put others down for their own benefit? How does Jesus respond to this bully? Our point number one, we got three of them for you today, is Jesus shows grace. To the bully. Amen. Jesus shows grace to the bully. The term that's translated grace most often in the Bible is a term that speaks to you showing someone goodwill or loving kindness or favor. The Bible speaks about how God shows grace to sinful people. He shows us grace when we have not earned relationship with him, when we have not merited to be in his family, we have not merited with our actions or our works to be saved by God and be able to become one of his people, but he still extends his favor to us, he shows us grace. And we get a picture of this grace in the story of Jesus and Zacchaeus. Verse 5, and when Jesus came to the place, this is where Zacchaeus was up in the tree, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. Now at this time, staying with someone it was a means of spending time with them, but to some degree, socially speaking, it was also a bit of a statement. It was also a statement of the fact that you um, had some, some form of fellowship with this person, some form of unity, some form of friendship, some type of common ground with this person. It, it communicated acceptance of this person. Zacchaeus is likely an outcast. He was likely very much hated by those around him. Jesus points to Zacchaeus and says, I need to come to your house. Now, you got to remember, there's a crowd of people around Jesus, probably people known for being more righteous than Zacchaeus. Probably people who are known for doing the right things and being pious and, and, and walking in holiness in a way of trying to follow God. Jesus looks at Zacchaeus, the outsider, the bully, the outcast, the one who participated in and also facilitated blatant and intentional oppression of God's people. And he says, I got to come to your house today. He went to the house of the one who was hated for his sin and the way he had oppressed and bullied others. Verse 6. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. So Zacchaeus hustles down from the tree, gladly receives Jesus, verse 7. And when they saw it, this is the people, the crowd, when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. They didn't appreciate that this is who Jesus chose to interact with, to associate himself with, to fellowship with, to stay with. It's likely, looking at the verbiage that they were using, that Jesus didn't just go over for a meal, but likely this is where he was staying for the period of time that he was in Jericho as he was choosing to, to travel through or move through Jericho. So he had that time that obviously they didn't move from city to city as fast as, as we did. Oftentimes, if, if it's a long journey, they'll want to find a place to stay and rest before they get back on foot and continue to leave. He said, I'm staying with Zacchaeus. The people saw that and they grumbled. They didn't like it. They were angry. They were frustrated of how Jesus was showing grace to this person. How can Jesus be with this man, this sinner who is harming us, who is oppressing us, who is using his power and his authority to harm us for his own benefit? It seems they didn't want grace for Zacchaeus. They didn't desire for that to be the case. I just want to know, are there kinds of people for you that you aren't comfortable with God forgiving and showing his grace to? Are there kinds of people that you would just prefer God judge and not save? Are there kinds of people that you would find more joy and satisfaction for God judging them than God saving them? The word of God says that it is not his will that any would perish. The people here, it seems like it was their will for Jesus to not fellowship with this brother. The question that that presents to us is are we in the same situation? Do we have the same mindset? Do we have the same thoughts and approach and views as the crowd here that is with Jesus? You need to know that if that is the case, then you are the they in this story. You're the ones grumbling that God would bless and save and show his grace to someone that hurt you, to someone that harmed 
you. I just want to remind us Romans chapter 12, verses 19 through 21. This is one of my favorite, probably my favorite passage in the Bible when it comes to how we are to respond to those who have hurt us. I think it tells us what to do and also gives us insight to our own hearts and our own soul as well. Romans 12, 19 says, Beloved, it's the Apostle Paul talking to people that he loves, that he cares about. What he's going to say to them is rooted in his love for them as well as his love for God. He said, Beloved, never avenge yourselves. To avenge is to get back at someone, to seek to make them pay, maybe to make them feel what they made you feel. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. He's saying, hey, don't, don't feel like you have to make someone feel what they made you feel. God says, let me handle that. I got that. My wrath is... so." One thing I consistently talk, talk to people about when it comes to forgiving other people, we need to have an, an appropriate theology of God's grace and believe in the sufficiency of God's grace. We also got to believe in the sufficiency of God's anger and wrath as well. You got to be able to know that God's anger is enough. You ain't got to add nothing to it. You ain't got to put nothing else on it. Understand that every sin, whether it's on the cross of Christ or whether it's for all eternity, for those who have not placed faith in Christ, you got to know that every sin will be paid for. Listen, I know that Zacchaeus is, is someone who's in a place that he, that in the earth, given the courts, whether they had a Supreme Court or not, on the earth, he, his sins were not paid for in a, in a manly or earthly way. But there's a court that sits higher even than the Supreme Court. There's a court that sits higher than every other court, and he says all sins will be paid for. He said, don't avenge yourselves. I got that. Let me handle that. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Verse 20. To the contrary, so instead of getting vengeance, to the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. It's an expression. It's basically saying when you do that, you, it will show how wrong this person is. Right? It will show that this person is in the wrong and you are in the right. Here's the part I love the most, verse 21. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. If you respond to sin with sin, then now you're allowing the sin and the evil that has impacted you to not only impact you, but overcome you and control you. If you are unable to walk in forgiveness, and by forgiveness I just mean being willing to not pay somebody back for the thing that they did wrong to you, then you have become overcome by the thing that you hate. You have become overcome by the thing that has harmed you and affected you. He's saying, no, no, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. How do we do that? He gave us the answer earlier. It's forgiveness, and it's also if, you're, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heat burning coals on his head. What is he saying? He's saying, show grace to the ones that hurt you. Don't try to get back at them. Don't get vengeance. Leave that up to God. God's going to handle the vengeance, and showing the vengeance, you handle the showing of the grace knowing that God has shown grace to you. The way you respond to someone who has hurt you, the way you respond to a bully often says a lot about whether or not you've been overcome by evil. Some may say, well, why doesn't Jesus confront Zacchaeus? The man is wronging Jesus' people. He's holding them down. He's robbing them of resources and thus opportunities. I mean, grace is good and all that, but this man needs to be stopped, right? Doesn't Jesus care about the injustice and want it to stop? Point number two, Jesus' grace leads to repentance and transformation. Jesus' grace leads to repentance and transformation. Verse eight, and Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, today, salvation has come to this house, since he is also, a son, also is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and save the lost. I believe that last verse is for uh, the crowd that was, that was there, that was upset that Jesus was going to this person who they called a sinner. He said, I came to seek and save the lost. This is what I'm here to do. So Jesus stays at Zacchaeus' house. The people hate Jesus. The people that hate Zacchaeus, they're grumbling against Jesus. They're grumbling and Jesus is transforming. The haters are complaining and Jesus is saving. Come on. He's being gracious. He isn't being soft on sin. He's not tolerating sin. Quite the opposite. He's actually waging war against sin and oppression that they hated. They just couldn't see it. 
In the Bible, God does often, often, dozens of times, have very sharp words against those who would participate in blatant and willful oppression of others. Very, very sharp words that will make you gasp that they even come out of the mouth of God. Words like, I'll cut off your whole generation. The words that are extremely sharp, and we need to realize that. We also need to realize that God shows grace to those who take advantage of others as well. Not only do we need to realize that God shows grace to those who are taking advantage of others, but he is able to, through his grace, bring transformation into their lives. He responds to their oppression, to Zacchaeus, I should say, oppression, his willingness to push others down for his gain. He responds to it with kindness and grace. Romans chapter 2 says, the kindness of God leads us to repentance. Titus chapter 2 verse 11 says, for the grace of God has appeared, and this is what the grace of God does, bringing salvation for all people, also what the grace of God does, does, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present ages. And this is what the appearance of God's grace does. It transforms us. It trains us to live in the way that God has called us to live. It trains us to renounce ungodly and worldly passions. That word that's translated renounce there means to disavow, to reject, to deny, to refuse. God's grace trains us to live in the way that God calls us to live. The best way that I want to, that I understand of how to illustrate this, the, the how do God's sometimes very firm, very direct, very blunt commands, and when he talks about even the consequences of not obeying him, how does that work together with his grace when looking to bring transformation? I believe this is very important for Christians to understand. The best illustration I know how to use is that of a car. So you're, you're, you're on the journey trying to go where God is calling you to go in your life. God's law, his command, I would say, is the steering wheel, but his grace is the engine. God's law and his command is the steering wheel. It lets you know where to turn. It lets you know where to go. It lets you know what's the right way and what's the wrong way, but his grace is the engine. It is the power source that is needed for you to actually get there. Both are extremely needed. Now, for most of us as believers, in my, at least from my experience, tend to lean real hard in one of the other directions. In times when we want to be used by God or in times when we want to see someone change or go in a different direction, we either lean hard in towards the law and just want to make sure people know how wrong they are for what they are doing, or we want to say nice things and very kind things and show grace and love to the person. God does both. And to not do both is to be out of balance and out of step with God. Those who think the message about God's grace and forgiveness, and there are some who think this, Those who think the message about God's grace and forgiveness will cause Christians to feel more of a license to sin don't know anything about God's grace. Because biblically speaking, the message of God's grace doesn't just offer us freedom from the guilt of sin. It also offers us freedom from the power of sin. It frees us from slavery to sin. Romans chapter 6, after the Apostle Paul states that where sin abounds, grace much more abounds, he says this in Romans 6, chapter, I'm oh, sorry, chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. He says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue to sin that grace may abound? So he's saying since God has all this grace, should we just be able to continue to sin because there's going to be more and more grace that covers it? Verse 2, by no means. How can we who die to sin still live in it? What he's saying is those who have truly experienced God's grace, have now died to sin in Christ. Those who truly and thoroughly understand the the work of grace in their lives, they know that they have died to sin. So how can they continue to live in it? How can they continue to practice sin as a lifestyle without turning to God in repentance over and over again if they know that they have died to sin? Those who truly and thoroughly understand grace, we look at sin and say, no, no, that's dead to me. I am dead to this, and this is dead to me. That is the response of those who truly understand, who have a thorough understanding and have fully embraced the grace of God in our lives. God's grace to us is not a license to sin. It is actually God's power to free us from sin. But oftentimes when people aren't changing or growing as fast as we'd like them to, we forget that. 
That's why some preachers go on and on about how you need to do better, and I, and I can't see why Christians do this, and I can't believe a Christian would do that. And oftentimes, it's because we believe that if we feel bad enough about our sin, then we'll turn away from it. And, and, and honestly, hopefully you know this, grieving sin is good, and that's a righteous thing to do, but that in and of itself doesn't possess the necessary power that we need to turn away from sin. We need also a thorough understanding of God's grace. That's why there are some preachers, and they probably wouldn't say this out loud, but but if you pay attention to the overall arc of their preaching and teaching ministry, there's way more heavy-handedness on what we should not do than there are of bringing the comfort of the gospel, revealing God's grace to his people. When that, is, when that is taking a place, when preachers do this, what we're doing is we're trying to preach people into transformation through condemnation rather than transformation through salvation. And there's a big difference. I'll say that again. When preachers do that, what's going on is they're trying to, trying to preach people into transformation through condemnation rather than transformation through salvation. And there's a very big difference between the two. The word in the Bible that is often translated preach is a word that actually means to be a herald. The term herald refers to someone, now again, at this time, especially if you consider uh, the empire of Rome and how vast it was, if they want, if in our day, if, if the government wants to get a message out to the people, very easy to do it, stand in front of a camera, you can put it on Twitter and it's out there fast. A bunch of likes, a bunch of shares, you can get it out there fast. At this time, they, obviously they couldn't do anything like that. They couldn't drive a car. They couldn't send anything electronically or through the internet or anything like that. So they would send these people out to the towns, to the cities, and sometimes they would go and stand in the town square and they would, they would yell loudly the decree or whatever is sent, whatever the official message of the king is. They would communicate that to all who would hear. Those people were called heralds. They were bringing official news from the king. That's what heralds were. The primary word used to describe the ministry of preaching is a term that actually means herald. It means to bring official news from the king to the people. So actually, if someone is coming and they're calling themselves preaching and all they're doing is talking about how wrong the people of God are by what they're doing, they're actually not preaching. Because preaching requires bringing news. What news do preachers of the gospel are they supposed to bring? It's the good news of the gospel himself, the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ. So to actually preach means that we are communicating the official good news that Jesus has come to save us from sin. That's what it actually means to preach. As much as I would love, thank you, as much as I would love, as much as I would love for everyone that is in this room to be a, a part of this church forever, I've realized that there are times when God may call you somewhere else. And I'm communicating this because you need to know what preaching actually is and what it is not. Preachers bring good news over and over and over again. And if, there is a, in the, if there's a consistent pattern, I'm not saying you judge this based off of one sermon. I'm saying there's a consistent pattern in a preaching ministry where the good news of Jesus is not consistently bringing brought up. You're not sitting under preaching. I don't know what you're sitting under, but you're not sitting under preaching. So when preachers always focus on what we are to do while failing to communicate what God has done, they aren't preaching because they aren't bringing the good news. So the preaching ministry is actually more about the sinfulness of people than about the glory and the salvation of God. And you need to stay away from that man-centered preaching. You need to continue to sit under a preaching ministry that communicates time and time again the grace of God. We all need to be consistently reminded of the gospel of Jesus and his grace towards us, knowing that gradually, sometimes very slowly over time, God uses that to grow us as mature Christians. Sometimes instead of remembering that it's God's grace that leads us to repentance and leads us to transformation, preachers can believe that people just need to be reminded of how wrong they are and be told what they should be doing differently But it's not just preachers that believe that. It's not just preachers that believe that. If you are a follower of Jesus, God desires to use you to help bring other Christians into maturity. Somebody say, God wants to use me. It is, a, it is a biblical and godly thing for us to serve and labor alongside each other to help each other mature and grow in Christ. But sometimes we find that to be a very frustrating endeavor and a very frustrating thing to do because we forget that ultimately it's Christ's grace that grows people in Christ and not us. 
God wants us to contribute to the process of other people's growth in Christ, but we want to be in control of the process of other people's growth in Christ. I want to say that again. God wants us to contribute to the process of other people's growth in Christ, but we often want to be in control of other people's growth in Christ. Whether that be a friend, another church member, a life group member, family member, spouse, child, parent, whoever, often your lack of patience is rooted in the fact that you don't trust God to change people through his grace. So when you've been encouraging them and giving them that great counsel and advice, y'all know what I'm talking about, and they're not growing as fast as you want them to, you get angry at them like you get to set the timeline for their growth and maturity in Christ. You get frustrated at the, at the pace of their growth because you don't like the timeline of their growth and maturity in Christ. I mean, I just, and I'm asking this as lovingly as I know how. Who do you think you are? Who do you think you are that you would be in control of the timeline of someone's growth in Christ? You're angry because you don't feel like you're getting the return on your investment as if they are as if they owe you some level of maturity because of all the time you spent encouraging and challenging them in the Lord. When you labor to help people grow in Christ, but doubt and forget the reality that is God's grace that brings transformation, God's grace that brings salvation, you will make someone else's growth in Christ about you. And you'll get frustrated and angry and impatient with them when they do not meet your expectations. You are not God. You are not God. It's not your grace and your love and your sacrifice that saves and changes people. It is Jesus' grace and Jesus' love and Jesus' sacrifice that saves and changes people and makes them more like him. And when you stop trusting in his grace to be the thing that works in people's life to change people, not only does it lead to frustration, sometimes in anger, sometimes in patience, Sometimes it actually leads to hopelessness and desiring to give up. Because you're like, I done told this person. I done told them twice. We done had two sit downs about this whole situation that I'm bringing up to them and they still ain't changing. I guess it ain't no use now. What's the point in continuing on? They obviously aren't listening to me. As if your growth is fast. As if you haven't had to be told the same thing over and over and over again in order for you to grow. You know what this process looks like, but you desire because we forget, because we forget that it is God's grace. It is God's work in people's lives that changes them. And so when we see our efforts not measuring up or or not just not, not just not measuring up, when we see our efforts not producing the result that we want, we feel like we need to give up because we've been trusting in ourselves the whole time. Instead of trusting in God's transforming power and his grace over time to transform people the same way that he's doing that with you. Over and over again, time and time again, if you find yourself losing hope, if you find yourself desiring to to wash your hands with someone and say, listen, I've been talking with this person a few times. They obviously aren't listening to me. I'm done with this. You need to remember that that's not how God treats you. And he has had more reasons to do that with you than you have had with this person that you're thinking of. God's grace is persistent. It continues on. Do not ever consider someone to be a lost cause. Do not ever give up on someone. Even if the way that you desire for them to grow changes, even if it needs to look different, do not ever throw your hands up in hopelessness and believe that somebody is a lost cause because that's not what God did with you. But when you know that it's God's grace that changes people and not you, you know that no one is too far gone. No matter how sinful they are, no matter how immature they are, no matter how slow they seem to be to grow in the ways that you've been encouraging them to grow, no matter how long it takes, no matter how much it seems like you're encouraging them time and time again and they just aren't listening to you, when you understand that it's actually God that transforms them over time through his grace, you can continue to persist and love and serve and encourage and nothing can stop you. And nothing will stop you because you know That as you continue to encourage them in the Lord, you know that God has the power to change them. You know that he is more powerful than whatever it is that is leading them away from him. You know that he cares about them and loves them more than you do. You know that the work that he began in them, he will continue to perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. You know that God hasn't started anything in them that he is not intending to bring to completion and finish in their life. So you always have reason to continue on with encouragement and prayer and love and grace. Y'all know that the saints who have seen the faithfulness of God over time 
have said for generations that he may not come when you want him. Hey, but he'll be there right on time. Amen. If we're going to faithfully, this is important as a church collectively, corporately, if we're going to faithfully be a Jesus in family on mission with him, we have to remember that it is God and his grace that saves and changes people and makes them more like him and not us. Whether you stand in the pulpit like me or not, as Christians, we must, re- we must remember that it's God who transforms us into his image. And that leads to our third and final point. Jesus makes us more like him. Jesus makes us more like him. This gets into the specifics of what transformation actually looks like and how you can notice it happening. If you want to know if you're growing in Christ, ask yourself if you're growing in Christ likeness. Read the Bible, learn about Jesus, take notes of the, aspect in, the aspects of your life and your character that aren't exactly Christ-like, and check to see if you are becoming more like Christ in some of those areas. I'm not going to spoil this right now because you're going to hear about it on Baptism Sunday coming up at the end of the month. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not going to spoil everything. I was talking to a brother that's going to get baptized okay. here in his testimony. He was telling me how he noticed in the Word of God how Jesus is compassionate. How Jesus is gracious with other people. And he said, that's one of the things that I noticed Jesus doing in me is I'm more gracious with others and more gracious with myself now as a result of knowing knowing Jesus. This is what transformation looks like. And there's testimonies all in this room of God using his grace to transform us, to make us more like him and show more grace to other people than we have before. In the ordinary, or at least seeming ordinary, everyday work of faithfully following Jesus step by step, His grace transforms us and causes us to look more and more like Him. We see that very clearly in Zacchaeus' life. Remember, Zacchaeus was not just a part of, but he was helping to run and lead this blatantly oppressive taxation system against his own people. He was pushing people down to lift himself up. He was pursuing his benefit at other people's expense. He was causing other people pain for his own selfish gain. But then Zacchaeus, this bully, has an encounter with the grace of our Lord Jesus. And he's transformed and becomes more like Jesus in the area where he was far from being like Jesus. I'm going to look at verse 8 again. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my goods I give to the poor. Some translations translate that word goods as half of my, half of my possessions I give to the poor. He goes from someone who is willing to take advantage of the poor so that he can become rich, to saying half of my possessions, consider the downsizing, consider the decrease in his standard of living at this point. He's saying half of my possessions, I'm just going to give it to the poor. And that's only the beginning. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. So we don't have time to turn there right now. Leviticus chapter 6 has the law that God gave to his people, to Zacchaeus' people where it says that if you gain anything from stealing or from, or from oppression, not only do you have to return it, but you have to return it with one, with one fifth more than what you took, 20% more than what you took. But Zacchaeus, after coming into, the, after having this interaction with Jesus and his grace, he's not approaching this as a situation as to say, okay, well, what do I need to do so that I'm not being considered as sinful in this area? That's not his approach. Because Zacchaeus says, not only am I going to give away half of my stuff to the poor, anything that I took from someone wrongly, I'm going to restore it 400%, he says. The law said add in 20%. He says, I'm going to restore 400% anything I took from someone wrongly. This is not just a man that's trying to look righteous. This is a man that's being transformed. This is a man who has experienced true repentance. Why? Because he met Jesus and had an encounter with Jesus' grace. This man went from pushing people down to lift himself up to pushing himself down to lift others up. This man went from pushing, from pursuing his benefit at other people's expense to pursuing the benefit of others at his expense. He went from causing other people pain for its own selfish gain to hurting himself financially so that others could gain. What's happening here? He's encountered the grace of Jesus and now he's becoming more and more like Jesus. Because this is exactly what Jesus does for us. Just a few chapters later in this very book, Jesus is is brutally beaten and tortured and executed on a cross as he's carrying the sins of the world so that I can be saved and so that you can be saved from sin. So Jesus suffered oppression so that we could be freed from from the slavery of sin, which is our spiritual oppression. 
He died so that we could have eternal life. He took our sin upon himself so we could be justified and made righteous before God. Jesus allowed himself to be pushed down so that we could be lifted up. Jesus pursued the benefit of others at his own expense. Jesus allowed himself to suffer pain so that we can gain and have eternal life with him forever in paradise where there is no pain. This is who Jesus is. And then when we look at what happened to Zacchaeus, what we see is not only is he transformed, but more specifically, he's being transformed to be more like Christ. He met Jesus, he experienced his grace, and he became more like his God. And this is what Jesus had to say, verse 9. And Jesus said to him today, Salvation has come to this house since he is also a son of Abraham. Jesus sees that Christ's likeness produced in him and he says, this man is saved. This man has placed faith in me. Jesus wasn't, here's the thing, I asked this question earlier. When Jesus showed grace to this brother, Jesus wasn't being soft on sin. Jesus was actually using the most powerful thing to help this man turn away from sin, which is his grace. I need, I need for us to understand, especially those of us in the room, you know who you are, our truth tellers. You know who I'm talking about. You prefer to tell it exactly how it is, the way people take it is the way they take it. You're just a messenger telling it how it is, right? You just need to know. You need to see stories like this one in the Bible and understand that even though the, telling the truth is obviously extremely important, Showing and sharing and continuously reminding people of the good news of Jesus, being a herald and reminding people of the grace of Jesus is also a step in the right direction and is the very power of God, Romans 1.16 says, to, to empower people to find salvation and be transformed in Christ. He could have just told, he could have just told Zacchaeus, all right, here's what you need to do. Stop doing what you're doing. Give it back with 20% interest. That's what he could have did. Instead, he goes and shows Zacchaeus his grace and Zacchaeus goes and sells half of what he has and gives it to the poor and then gives everything back that he took from defrauding people with 400% interest on top. May we look at Zacchaeus and may we be reminded of the great grace that God has shown us as all of us have sinned against him. And may we also be reminded of how we ought to be about the work of continuing to share God's grace with others. Jesus showed grace to the bully. His grace led this man to repentance this bully was transformed and became a, went from being a bully to being a blessing to those around him. What an incredible Savior that we have and what incredible grace we have received in him.